He, did, he never did go to um, America. But my brother wrote a song called The Land of the Gale, which is uh, very well known at the moment. I wish I was westward of Jingle on the golden sands of Bearborn, where I'd wait for the mountain of Brandon to appear in the red light of dawn. I gaze over Smerrick Harbour, see the yacht with its blowing sail, and my body is here in the bowery, yet my heart's in the land of Wales again. Too free with the juice of the barley, it softens my will and my brain. And whenever I save a few dollars, should I fall off the wagon again? But I'm thinking of Kerry and Ireland, of the Blaskets and Fair County Bay. When the sun is a red ball of fire, as it sets on the land of the gale. Ah, the wind, like a knife, it goes through me. And with hunger I'm ready to fall. The snowflakes are swirling around me as I head for the church mission hall. But I hear the sweet song of the sky lark, and I listen to the Corlew's sad wail as over the ocean they call me to come back to the land of the gale. It's fifty long years since I left it, a young fellow still in my teens. Do I ever return now, you ask me? Should I go back every night in my dreams? But the call of my homelands are powerful, and I'm thinking this time I'll not fail. Once again I'll be young, and I'll hear my own tongue. And I'm home in the land of the game. The spa. We were going up the spa, and it was a great walk on Sunday evenings when we had no car to go to bed, but you'd go up the river and you'd go up to the diving board, the rocks, the well, and the falls above at the far end. Um, here we have the town park, and I would ask people to put up their hands, many of you know it, it's called Children's Park, after asking children. It's still known to us as the Cow's Lawn, <laughs> and therein lies a whole history of how it became that and became secured for the people of Lestor. Um It will belong to Lord Lestor, and in the late 19, 18, 17, 18, uh, there was a shortage of food and a committee was set up in the, the town to procure land to grow their own food and they put their eye on the, these fields here. Um, there is no evidence uh, as a precursor to that that the elders of the store or the well-informed of the famine in the 1840s came to the aid of its tenants at that time uh, and there was a, the estate a number of incidents occurred in 1917-18, typifying the unyielding and inflexibility of the attitude of the hares and their agents to the people of the area. The winter of 1916-17 was particularly difficult for the poor of Listowel. There was a serious shortage of turf. There was a, uh, Mr. Morris O'Connell, clerk of Listowel Unit, launched a f fuel for the poor fund, uh, and there was also a shortage of food. The, uh, it seems that the Earl of Listowel, or at least his agent, refused to be associated with the project. And with the advent of spring conditions became more difficult, the poor of the town due to water shortages and the steeply rising food prices. Consequently, early in the February of 1917, the Restorer Council requested the Earl of Restore to make two large fields known as two lawns available for cultivation by the poor people of the town. His lordship to his agent, Edward O'Brien, offered a few scraps of land which were already being used. And therein is the struggle. In actual fact, Lord Lestore sold it to an intermediary friend of his for something like £1,400. 
and, and a group of the restored people went in and ploughed up the fields. One of them was the, the aforementioned Jack McKenna, John McKenna, and he was in prison for a month. But eventually the food committee uh, agreed that it, they would buy the land for the poor and they had to pay a £1,400, which was an enormous amount of money at that time. I have in front of me a copy of the trust deed of 14th of September 1920. And it's Thomas Armstrong, that was the, the man that the hair had sold to for 1400 And then you have the Nestor Food Com uh, Committee, uh, various members, Thomas J. Walsh, Sean McKenna and others. And then you had the Nestor Cow Keepers, who were a number of people who would be give out uh, pasture grazing to the uh, to farmers here. And it was expressly to permit the Nestor Cow Keepers to, to this past the pasture milk cows upon the said land at such times and subject to such condition as to the payment or otherwise as the store food committee or failing them the trustees may from time to time uh, direct and appoint provided that no person shall be permitted to have on the lands more than two cows in any year. And there was also a clause which is, well, it caused trouble some years later uh, when they were building the sports centre. Uh, they call it the community centre, but I like to refer to it as the sports centre because there's not many community activities for old fellows like me there, unless you can play indoor soccer or basketball. But uh, there was, in this trust deed, a condition that no building was to be built on those lands. So the question arose, the, the food committee and the trustees had disbanded and was taken over by the Urban Council. How would the Urban Council, putting on my legal hat, allowed to allow a building to be put on that place. That's another scale. However, um, just before we move on to the Garden of Europe, um, we're here on a beautiful spot, and years ago, I remember being on the 15A bus in Dublin, going down through Ratgar, and a man came in and sat alongside me, and it was none other than Eamon Keane, John B's brother, to Joker. And he, I introduced myself to him, and he started to cry. And I said to him, why, Eamon? What I wouldn't give, he says, to be sitting on the bench, on the banks of the field, below the big bridge, looking up at the spa. And I thought it was the most moving encounter I had ever done. My father wrote, there is another aim of mine which I hesitate to reveal. I have a distant goal of viewing my country as the last haven of the imagination. A place where the materialistic inhabitants of much of the globe their variegated appetites sapped by materialism and consumerism and bloated by countless distractions may find sustenance and provender of mind together peace and harmony within themselves. If I am right in this, the Irish world we inhabit could be a resource of great international value. Our greatest resource is our people. This aim should manifest itself in our literature. And a quotation from him, which I can't bring correctly, but it went something like this. He said an old woman told him one day, there are 27 words in the Lord's Prayer. There are 110 words in the Ten Commandments. There are 250 words in the American Declaration of Independence. And there's 26,711 words in a recent EEC directive about the size and quality of duck eggs. <laughs> <laughs> what way would you think he'd vote on Brexit? <laughs> It's called the Garden of Europe. The Garden of Europe was uh, built as a project by the Listol Chamber of Commerce back in the 1990s under the leadership of the one and only Paddy Fitzgibbon and his wife Carmel. They are wonderful gardeners. Uh, it contains the only monument to the Holocaust in Ireland. You can see it down here in front of us. It also contains a sculptor, the John B. Keane. It was created by a sculptor whose father was Tarrant, and he's a sculptor in New York. And he also was the sculptor that put the sculpture of the nun outside the Catholic Church. This originally, to the east side, was the Listowel Quarry, where a lot of the stone from the Listowel houses was built. The, the quarry became defunct in the 18, 1940s. It then became the Listowel Dump. 
And when we were young, we came down there, and you you could go 40 feet down below, down to the quarry, the, the floor of the quarry. And there was a big hole there, it was a quarry hole. We were told if you ever fell in there, you'd fall into hell. <laughs> but anyway, when I was a bit younger, a gentleman, a neighbor of mine called Thomas Sheehan, uh, had the worst form of TB. And he was given up to die several times. Eventually, he was cured. And he came back to the store, but he was treated by a leper, as a leper. And Father Moore, who was cured at the time, took pity on him and said we'd have to build a house. So with the help of Toddy Buckley, that was foreman of the Open Council, he built a, store, a block and a corrugated iron a hood or shed up here in the top corner. And Thomas lived down there for about five years. And he told me after, whatever they done in the sanatorium wasn't as good as what he got in the dump. <laughs> and he would have been a second cousin of mine, Thomas. But he was the nicest man in the world until he got drinking. And then he became the most obnoxious man in the world. Now, they lived in poverty, his family. His, his, his mother was May Hennessy. And she had one brother. There was two in the family. And the brother's name was Mike Joe. And Mike Joe, there was a tradition of uh, butterage, buttering and, in the Hennessy's. So Mike Joe used to kill cow or a pig and he tried to sell it around the country. But then he found there was a big market in Belly Duff. So he went off to Belly Duff. And he used to travel over by horse and cow with his meat one day a week, two days a week. All of a sudden, he travelled over five days, and then he bought a house there, and then he bought another house, and he finished up with the wealthiest man in Belly Duff, and he owned half Belly Duff. His family then became hurlers, as was the tradition in Belly Duff, and they were the most famous hurlers in Kerry, the Hennessy brothers. Two of them went to New York, Brendan and Michael, and they played for New York, and they beat Wexford, in what was known as the unofficial All Ireland in 1956, Brendan and Tom, and uh, now Thomas Sheehan had a, another number, uh, another uh, number of brothers and sisters. Three of them died of TB. They, they lived in object poverty. Now Thomas, Thomas's brother, he had two brothers that went to New, uh, went to New Jersey, Clem and Chas, and Chas got married to a Dublin woman, she came back, and it's ironic, my sister was matron in Mount Carmel in Dublin, and she never knew that Thomas's, uh, Thomas's sister, Chas, uh, brother Chas had come back with his wife, and their first child was born, and my sister actually delivered the young boy without knowing he was our cousin. Anyway, Kieran Sheehan went back to America with his father and mother after a year, and he took, he was dramatic, uh, he became an actor, and he was a very good singer. And that man turned out, he was the lead, he had the lead role in Les Mis and uh, The Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. And he was a son of Paul Lane. Good luck, <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> but there is a very, very famous film star, Mary Pickford. And Mary Pickford came to the store one time because Mary Pickford's mother was Charlotte Hennessy. And Charlotte Hennessy would have been a second cousin of the people I'm talking about. But she never knew who she was related to when she came back. And she was told by Brian McMahon's grandmother, who she met who, when she was cleaning the church. Women used to go down and they cleaned the church voluntarily before they decided they'd have to be paid. So Mrs. Uh, Mrs. McMahon used to go down, clean the church with other ladies, and uh, me, what's her name again? Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford. Okay, arrived down, and uh, she asked Mrs. McMahon, did she know any of the Hennessy's? And she was directed back to Hunter Street. 
And there was one of the Hennessys living there, Michael, with his sister, Hannah. And they lived in a two-roomed house. And me, Hennessy, or me, Mary Pickford arrived with her entourage of about 20. And they proceeded to go into the house with a door about that size. And then they filled the kitchen. And Hannah got such a fright, she finished up under the bed. <laughs> there was two beds in the room. And she went out anyway. She was told that they had relations in Ballyduff. And there was a hotelier in Market Street called Connor who never got on with my two Hennessy. So when he went out to Valley Duff uh, with Mary Pickford, uh, he pretended to go into a house and ask people, did they know any of the Hennessy's in Valley Duff? And he came out and he said to Mary Pickford, I'm afraid they're all dead and gone. Mm -hmm. And they came back to Listowel and she never met the Hennessy's in Valley Duff. But Teddy Hennessy, the butcher in Valley Duff now, my cousin, he said to me, Jesus Vincent, if we had met him, we'd all finished up in Hollywood. <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. Two quotations. Two quotations. I'll tell you who said them afterwards. Not to learn Irish is to miss the opportunity of understanding what life in this country has meant and could mean in a better future. It is to cut oneself off from the ways of being at home. If we regard self-understanding, mutual understanding, imaginative enhancement, cultural diversity and a tolerant political atmosphere as desirable attainments, we should remember that a knowledge of the Irish language is an essential element in their realisation. It was written not by my father, but none other than Seamus Heaney. And it's a pity that we haven't treasured our own language, uh, and it's a shame, really. Second quotation. Being a Kerry man, in my opinion, is the greatest gift God can bestow on anyone. <laughs> when you belong to Kerry, you know you have a head start on the other fella. In belonging to Kerry, you belong to the elements, to the spheres spinning in the heavens. You belong to history, and language and romance and ancient song. It is almost unbearable being a Kerryman, and it's an awesome responsibility. <laughs> John B. <laughs> Con Hulhan, writing about Cleave Lucre, from and it could be about North Kerry as well in the stone. From whence came this special love of music, song and language? Should this common in people who live in the hills? Music especially is their anodyne. It is a great place for verbal artistry. And Eamon Kelly de Shanaki, in my father's time, who was actually my godfather and stood for me, said that you can garner that from the way we give names to potatoes. Mm -hmm. The Arden Banner, the May Queen, Kerr Pinks, the Golden Wonders, the British Queens, the Epicure, the Champion, and the Rooster. <laughs> and Eamon said that when he was working for the farmers uh, as a country boy, servant boy, especially at harvest time, when the Mehela men would come in in the evening and there'd be a big long kitchen table and they'd sit down and a big plate of spuds was put out in the middle. He says, I was there about a couple of weeks, he says, and I found out if you wouldn't quicken the draw in relation to potatoes, you didn't get enough to eat. Mm -hmm. So he says, I had to hatch a plan about eating potatoes, and the plan I had was be eating one, be peeling a second of your hand in a third, and your eye on a fourth. <laughs> So it is be eaten one, be peeled in a second, have your hand in a third and your eye in a fourth. <laughs> we'll move on out to the churchyard. <laughs>